Good morning, you magnificent melon heads. Happy Good Friday, everybody. Today is Friday, April 7th, 2023. Markets are closed today, but I went live anyway because we just got the March non farms payrolls report. Just came out a few moments ago. The U.S. economy added 236,000 jobs for the month of March. That was the headline number, and that is roughly in line with what was forecast. So you're probably going to see a little bit of talk in the traditional financial press about how this was kind of a Goldilocks report. They're going to be saying how this shows that the hiring is slowing. You may hear people saying the labor market is cooling. You may hear people saying, oh, this was it was just right. It wasn't too many jobs added, but it doesn't show a catastrophic increase in unemployment right where we need to be. And to a lesser extent, that's true. But when you really dig into the numbers, it's when you see the differences between the non-farm payrolls report that just came out and that ADP report that we got on Wednesday, there's a key difference between the two. There's a difference in the data, and it's a big one, especially considering what happened in March, what happened in mid-March. Now, with that, let's shrink my melon of a head, and let's take a look at the report. That is the wrong screen setting. Here we go. This is the one that I want. And we're looking at the U.S. economy created 236,000 jobs in March, the least since December of 2020. So that's why you're going to see people saying, hey, this shows the hiring is cooling because this is way down from where we were. And compared to forecasts of 239,000, roughly in line, after unusually mild weather and seasonal factors led to strong jobs gains in the first two months of the year. Now, here's where they break it up by sector. And there's there's some important granularity in this data here. Employment continued to trend up in leisure and hospitality by 72,000. All right, those are low wage, low paying jobs. And they continue to be the big gain category. And excuse me, that was the same thing we saw in the ADP report. We've seen this for several months. We've seen this in some of the services PMI. The economy is growing in the leisure and hospitality area, but that's not a good thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing to have growth in this area, but that is almost all of the growth is in leisure and hospitality, low wage service jobs. You cannot support a booming economy with waiters and bartenders that's just not enough all right they're saying namely food service and drinking places was where it was added we also had forty-seven thousand jobs added in government jobs professional and business services added thirty-nine thousand. that's important put a pin in that one professional and business services we're coming back to that because that's the big that's the big hiccup there also elsewhere they've got healthcare added thirty-four thousand. Meanwhile, employment edged higher in transportation and warehousing by 10,000, but fell in retail trade by 15,000, namely building material, garden equipment, and supplies dealers. So that's basically them saying like your Home Depots, right? Building material, garden, and supplies. Employment showed little change in mining, quarrying, oil and gas extraction, construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade information, financial activities. What? Employment showed little change in financial activities in March? When we had a bank run, hmm, that's another one we got to circle back to. The March reading pointed to a slowdown in the labor market as the economy normalizes after the pandemic and as high borrowing costs and prices force companies to cut costs. All right, so the ones I zeroed in on there, financial services being flat and the fact that they're saying professional and business services added 39,000 jobs. Those are some key, key numbers right there. That's telling me there's something wrong with the way they're collecting this data. So I had to go into the technical notes. This is the BLS website. All right, this is technical notes about how they collect their data. And I want to zero in on this paragraph here. They're saying for both surveys, that's the payrolls and the household surveys, the data for a given month relate to a particular week or pay period. In the household survey, the reference period is generally the calendar week that contains the 12th day of the month. The 12th day of the month. In the establishment survey, the reference period is the pay period, including the 12th, which may or may not correspond directly to the calendar week. Now, that is important right there because the 12th day of the month in March, that was Sunday, March 12th. That was right at the start of the bank run. All right. The Silicon Valley Bank failed on March 10th. That was a Friday. Everything really started to happen on March 9th that any jobs lost because of the bank run, any fallout from the financial sector did not show up in this non-farm payrolls report. 
that's a big deal, folks. Right? If if you're talking about, hey, what what happened in the jobs situation in March, and you're not including uh, the little bank run, the the tiny little second and third largest bank failures in U.S. history that happened in that month, well, then how how good is this data point? It's really not that good. We're not going to see the job losses from the bank runs until the April non-farm payrolls report. So that is a huge detail. And I don't think we're going to hear a lot about that in the financial press. And you can kind of see the difference here because on Wednesday, we got the ADP employment change. This is the private sector payrolls, right? So this is the number that came out on Wednesday. And this is one of the things that right away kind of ticked me off that not ticked me off, but alerted me that something was off here, right? Because Again, they're saying leisure and hospitality added 98,000 jobs, right? That's the big sector that's always growing. But they said job losses occurred in financial activities, minus 51,000. Remember, the non-farm payrolls that just came out said jobs were relatively unchanged in financial activities, financial services. Well, that's because the non-farm payrolls report took a snapshot before the bank failures. So there's another 50,000 job losses in financial services that did not show up in this non-farm payroll report that did show up in the ADP report. And on top of that, they're saying business and the professional and business industry lost 46,000 jobs in the ADP report. Well, when you go all the way back to the employment number, they're saying professional business services added 39,000. So you're looking at a delta here of about 85,000 jobs in professional and business services. Again, do you think maybe what happened to the banks, what happened in Silicon Valley, maybe that might affect professional and business service employment? Absolutely. And if you look at the technical notes, here's the ADP website. Again, I want to zero in on how the data is collected. And that's why you have to really scrutinize these reports. You can't just run with the headlines, right? That's what the financial press does. They run with the headlines. You can make the headlines say anything you want by, by jury rigging the data. Now, if you scroll all the way down on the ADP report website, go all the way down past all the meat and potatoes, and you get into the boring fine print at the bottom, that's where the juice is. Because here we go, right here. Because the underlying ADP payroll databases are continuously updated, we can create high-frequency, near real-time measures of U.S. unemployment. And that's the difference. The ADP payrolls, because it's based on current payrolls, the current pay period, not some snapshot taken on the 12th of the month. The ADP pay report, pay report is near real time. So you actually get a more accurate picture of the private sector. And I want to emphasize private sector employment in ADP. And so the ADP number included the bank run. The non-farm payrolls number did not include the bank run. And you're looking at a difference of about 100,000 jobs between the two. And I think the fact that they didn't start measuring until before until after the back let me rephrase that the difference being the bank run is not reflected in the non-farm payrolls report that's what it is and the big the big giveaway here was professional and business services adding 39,000 jobs when ADP showed them losing nearly 50,000 jobs that's a huge difference all right let's get into a little bit of the nitty-gritty here the unemployment rate ticked down to 3.5 percent in the month let me make this a little bit a little bit smaller. So we added jobs and the unemployment rate went down by 0.1%. That's about 160,000 people working. Uh, so we went from 3.6 to 3.5. That surprised me because remember, folks, we just had that big revision to the jobless data going all the way back to January. We I talked all about that in my stream yesterday. That has not shown up in this non-farm payrolls report. I was expecting a 0.2% increase in unemployment. I thought for sure we would see 3.8 this morning. We didn't. Now, I don't think the fact that the bank run is not sh reflected in this report, I don't think that's going to be enough to take us up to 3.8%. So there is still a big lag in the unemployment rate versus the joblessness rate versus people filing for unemployment benefits. I don't know what the lag is. I don't know what's causing it. I don't want to just default to say political reasons, although after, the, after what happened yesterday, that massive revision, it's kind of easy to do that. You can understand why people would do that. But suffice it to say, the recent trend of big layoffs and job losses is not yet showing in the unemployment rate. Now, we've got the labor force participation rate ticked up another tenth of a percent to 62.6%. We're still well below the labor force participation rate of the pre-pandemic era, 
but we're rising. People are being forced back into the labor market. M my guess is by financial hardship. You either have people unretiring or people who gave up looking for work are being forced to start looking again because life is getting more expensive. Life is getting harder for the average person. So they just have to work. And so we're seeing this continued uptick in labor force participation rate. Now, this is a, a big one. Average hourly earnings up 0.3% month over month. All right, that's not a huge number. That's roughly in line with some of the CPI readings. But check out the year over year number for average hourly earnings. Average hourly earnings in the United States edged up 4.2% year over year. That is now the 24th consecutive month of negative real wage growth in the United States. Two years running, two years straight, your pay has gone down relative to your standard of living or your cost of living, All right? If we really had a tight labor market, if we really had a strong jobs market, then the price of labor would not be going down. Now, the nominal price of labor is not going down, but the price of labor relative to goods and services is going down. And if we really had a strong jobs market, if we really had a labor shortage, the price of labor wouldn't be going down. The price of labor would be going up. So this right here, this chart is the key factor here that shows this story about the strong jobs market, the strong labor market. It is bunk. It is total horse manure. It is a lie being thrown out there to make excuses for what they're doing to people with their rate hikes, which are only necessary because of what they have done to people with their money printing and their inflation. This is central banks playing games, moving people around like pawns on a chessboard. And this has real world consequences for people's lives. Uh, what else we have? The average hours worked was down slightly this in this report. Average weekly hours in the United States decreased to 34.4 hours from 34.5. That's not a huge move, but again, it takes a lot to move the needle on this. For the average work week to tick down even a tenth of an hour is a big deal. So this is people's hours getting cut. This is the factory shutting down early because orders are down, right? This this is not surprising me to see the average work week shrinking right now. People are working fewer hours. Government payrolls, we're not going to get too much into this. Government payrolls ticked up by 47,000. Yay, I'm sure they're all IRS agents, and I'm sure they're totally not coming to audit everyday people and small business owners. Uh, Non-farm private payrolls increased by 189,000. That is the lowest private sector job growth going all the way back to really about two years now. Uh, what else we have? Manufacturing payrolls decreased by 1,000. That's two consecutive months of negative job growth in manufacturing. And this is roughly in line with some of these terrible manufacturing PMI reports we've been getting out of for the last couple of weeks that shows the manufacturing sector is in contraction for really for the better part of a year now. So we're, we're finally starting to see that show up in the employment numbers. All right. That is the granularity in the jobs report. I also want to talk about a couple of other things. We had a big announcement yesterday from Samsung. Samsung cut chip output to ride out the downturn and shares rally. Uh, look, this is this story just blew me away yesterday. Samsung Electronics said on Friday that it would make a meaningful cut to chip production following the lead of smaller rivals as it grapples with sharp global downturn in semiconductor demand that has sent prices plummeting. All right, so they're cutting production. There's a big slowdown in chips. Remember the chip shortage? Well, that's gone. Now they're saying there's a big slowdown in chip demand and chips are in everything. So. This is bad news for the global economy. The unusual output cut by the world's biggest memory chip maker with no previous announcement recalled by Samsung officials and analysts came after it flagged a worse than expected 96% plunge in first quarter profit. 96%. This is not a modest decline in earnings, folks. This is not an adjustment to generally accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. This isn't a one-time charge, a 96% plunge in profit. Oh, and by the way, I just want to say Samsung stock jumped 4.5% in early trading. So profits are down 96% and the share price is up 4%. So did the price to earnings multiple of Samsung just 20X overnight? Okay, okay, stock market, if that's what you want to pay for Samsung, I'm going to sit this one out. That's all I got to say about that. In my opinion, when the earnings of a company decrease by 96%, call me crazy, I think that stock should go, go down. You guys let me know. What do you think? If a stock's earnings fall 96%, do you think that stock should go down or should that stock go up? Hey, I'm willing to entertain 
all theories and all plausible explanations right now. You guys let me know. Also, elsewhere in the markets right now, we got BlackRock eases withdrawal block from 3.5 billion pound property fund. BlackRock is finally letting some of their investors out of their commercial property fund. BlackRock has started paying some institutional investors whose withdrawal requests from its 3.5 billion pound UK property fund had initially been blocked, according to a person familiar with the matter. The world's largest asset manager has begun to partially honor withdrawal requests made in the second quarter of 2022. So, okay, the headline, BlackRock eases withdrawal limits. Oh, they're letting people out of the fund. Maybe the commercial real estate thing isn't as bad as they're saying, right? That's what the headline is kind of suggestive of. And then you realize in the second paragraph, they're only partially honoring requests that were made a year ago. People have been asking for a year to have their money back, and they're only beginning to partially honor those requests now. So you'll forgive me if I don't sound the all clear on the commercial real estate market. So that is the story going on over at BlackRock. Here is your jobs numbers. And I got a, somebody I got to say thank you to in the super chats here this morning. Where are you in there? I got Mr. Nashville Pasta Man. Thank you, Pasta Man. Appreciate the super chat. He says, <laughs> Mish is underpaid. Get him some good oatmeal and biscuits. <laughs> oatmeal and biscuits for the man. You got it, Pasta. We're going to get Mish some oatmeal and some biscuits. And uh, I think he probably wants a bang energy drink with that. Mish, is it bang or monster? What's your, what is your preferred energy drink? I'm not sure. I, I recall which one. And I thank you very much, Nashville Pasta Man. I appreciate that. And Mish is all over the data points, especially those big revisions yesterday. He got that so fast. He picked up on what they had done to those uh, initial jobless claims and continuous claims. I mean, within minutes, he picked that up. So every channel needs a Mish. Thank you very much, Nashville Pasta Man. I appreciate the support of the channel. Look, guys, I want you to have a fantastic holiday this weekend. Enjoy your time with family. Um, look, Hard times coming. I talk about this a lot. Hard times are coming, but they're not quite here yet. So enjoy these days. There will come a time when you wish you had your current set of problems. It's coming. It's not here yet. So make the most out of this weekend. Thank you, Nashville Pasta Man, for the super chat and for the support of the channel. Thank you to my Patreon supporters for everything you guys do. Also, thank you very much to my moderators for keeping things neat and tidy in the chat. I appreciate everything you guys do for the channel. And until next time. Oh, wait, wait. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. Until next time, live small and dream big.